I've been working in non-formal education since 2004. Uh, I think it was the program Youth uh, that was uh, then running and then Youth in Action and Erasmus, Erasmus Plus and so on. So I've been um, going through different phases of what it is to be a trainer and what, what is the focus of the the youth uh, in Europe and, and so on. And uh, mostly I've been facilitating two to 10 day uh, residential courses on, uh, and the topics that I'm usually covering is embodied learning, body image lately, especially mentoring, sustainability and participation and also volunteering. I don't know how much actually courses I have led. It's it's a big question. I've never really calculated, but the approximate probably is 250 uh, if I'm uh, calculating 20 years with some 15 courses in total. But I think this is also one one interesting thing. Um, what business trainers are really good at doing, they, they uh, tell how many hours have they worked. And then in, in the youth work, I think we don't really put much emphasis on that. And that's uh, that that's a good selling point, which I think we should focus on more. And I will one day calculate all the hours as well, <laughs> but I haven't done it yet. And um, something also to uh, mention that I really, um, yeah, I'm a volunteer at heart. Uh, and it's not my joy um, to be doing a lot of service for society, but I believe that it's a, it's a big gift uh, that we can help each other and uh, find joy on those things. And um, I study psychology at the moment and I, my focus is uh, on climate emotions and the being of service and also uh, doing action for the community is a big antidote for a lot of anxiety. So I'm really excited to be researching more on how actually an action and volunteering might help our own nervous systems and, and um, yeah, how important it is also for us to feel better, to be able to contribute to community. And uh, I've been a movement and body work practitioner for over 20 years as well, working with individuals and groups on, on the exercise mats and on the body work tables and uh, seeing yeah, how, how I can work with a client's nervous system through movement and touch. This, this has been a um, yeah, big part of how I see the non-formal education as well, uh, because the principles that I apply uh, on the bodywork table or um, exercise mat are pretty similar um, to how I lead, lead trainings also with the presence and with mindfulness and consent and so on. And uh, then the late, late last thing, which I think is also important to mention about me, because it occupies a lot of my mind and time lately, is moving to the countryside. But why I mentioned that it's also uh, my decision to move to the countryside is also because I wanted to compensate so many years of traveling and, and so many um, years of being around people. I realized that being in solitude and being in nature is really, really helpful to keep balance and, and feel also joyful to keep working with the groups. I need that kind of uh, polarity in my life. And um, it's exciting. It's also a lot of work. <laughs> I'm in that phase, but I, I'm sure that uh, in, in a few months or a few years, I'll, I'll be more happier about the idea that I'm realizing at the moment. So that's me. Um, I will not be able to give you the right answers, how to um, take care of yourself and how to be well. I have failed so many times and I'm not very, um, I'm, I'm not shying away for um, sharing my mistakes and my kind of failings, because I think we all need to share it a little bit more. We are not much excellent at taking uh, taking well of ourselves, especially coming from non-profit world where the habit is taking care of the other people. But I will share some things that I find um, useful. Uh, I'll sh share some things that I find um, how helped me, or I think that they would be helpful. I haven't practiced it all. I have thought about it all though. So um, I'll share those things. And then going forward, um, when Marcus in, uh, sent me an invi invite also to participate in this webinar and talk a little bit more about these things, I um, thought how the concept of trainer has changed, at least in my head, uh, through 20 years. I've become also older, but I think youth work has developed, non-formal education has developed. And um, there, at least 20 years ago, there was a lot of emphasis of uh, trainer uh, as being a superhero, not having too many needs for sleep or rest, rather uh, being able to be every evening with participants and um, 
be able to meet with the team members until late nights and uh, sleep a little bit, wake up and be ready and happy for uh, group work. And what I'm trying to focus in the last years is humanizing the trainer and um, also showing it to the participants because we need that. We need also to um, share and express our needs for rest and care so that the others are kind of uh, able to um, yeah, realize the importance of that. I think it's similar to the teachers and trainers alike. It might be uh, yeah, that participants expect also you to be to be awake and happy 24 seven whilst actually you cannot be unless you take care of yourself. So I really do hope that we humanize the trainers or, or teaching positions per se um, even more. And um, when we talk about self-care, it's also a quote that I made <laughs> during this uh, presentation making also that self-care is revolutionary and role modeling self-care is educational. And why I want to talk about self-care as revolutionary, because if you look around the world and we need to take, talk about the context of self-care because we are interde interdependent on what's happening in the world. We are living in a fast-paced society where uh, business and speed is very um congratulated and rest is still considered lazy. And um, in my experience, working with a lot of colleagues, uh, I still feel guilt and shame if I wanna take the evenings away or if I don't wanna occupy coffee breaks with the work uh, or if I just wanna rest and do nothing or not communicate um, Yeah, uh, all the time. So. I still have this inner dialogue, whether I am doing my work well, if I'm not talking all the time, or if I'm not present all the time with my body or with my mind. So um, that just means also that I'm kind of indoctrinated uh, by how we see rest and how we see work. And um, also in evaluation forms, sometimes I read that um, the other trainer who does not go to sleep and does not go to rest is the best trainer because uh, they stay present. <laughs> so, of course, there's the sense of like, I also want to be a good trainer. So I'm going to stay because um, I want to, you know, I want to be liked alike. So there are a lot of these dimensions which I think are worth to be considered and uh and talked also with your colleague trainer why you think uh, the rest and, and uh, self-care is important aspect. And I also think that as a trainers, we have a role to uh, model self-care. I hear a lot of trainers speak about um, change after pandemics, that a lot of uh, participants seem to be more tired and not so engaged in sessions. I, I'm not sure if it's the same in your experience. It is in mine. And what I find important, it is not to fill the training course and the whole program with, with plenty of activities, which might seem to be super effective. And uh, we are here for the learning and we want to squeeze everything in. But the question is if it's effective, really, and if people are able to focus and if it's helpful for them and also for you. And sometimes during the program, um, when I organize activities, we make compulsory free evenings. So neither trainers, neither participants need to participate or it's obligatory for them not to participate. So we are relearning the concept of um, that you need to do something always in order to be effective and enjoying and learning. So that's that's already one tip that I yeah I would like to share the compulsory compulsory free um, moments. So. Um, yeah, so we uh, re model the self-care and also we have a chance to rest. Um, and something also to mention that and people, yeah, the trainers sometimes think it's, it's not so visible when uh, they are unrested or unwell. But in my experience, tension in the trainer is felt and reflected upon in the group as well. So the more relaxed and the more, more self-care you have practice, um, the more it shows in your presence and in the way uh, people perceive you. Again, you don't need to be perfectly um, non-anxious, uh, relaxed in order to be a trainer. But at the same time, you do little things that you can in order to um, kind of improve your presence and actually the quality of your work. And another thing is uh, what I want to emphasize because I have a microphone and I feel very strongly about especially after pandemics, 
is um, practicing not only the healthy boundaries, which is more uh, linked to the mental health that I'm not gonna um, concentrate a lot uh, in this webinar, but uh, health boundaries and practicing health boundaries is very essential as for the trainer and for the group. I still see some trainers going not feeling very well, meaning uh, having some, some uh, sickness that they can also give to participants. Um, into the training room and I really do hope that this will stop and uh, there is a time to rest and recover and not give um, unpleasant things for participants but I also hope that you step up and uh, make a make a rule for participants to um, be well in the training space and if uh, if they're not well um, as long as you want your place to be uh, welcomable, uh, think about the vulnerable and uh, ask participants to, to leave the, the course or space as much as it's possible. I really want to emphasize that because the health boundaries are so important. And if we talk about inclusion and if we talk about um, yeah, protecting the vulnerable, it's very essential. And also it's self-respect for us um, not to get sick and um, yeah, be present with, with the training program that we have prepared. So far, it's a little bit challenging when as a facilitator, you're not used to talk so much in one spot with the, with the silence. But uh, let's go on. And uh, I also want to share my disclaimer. Marcus shared his. And uh, I want to <laughs> disclaim that I'm going to share about my own experience here, which is kind of logical. But um, I have definitely changed my training style in 20 years and I have grown also a little bit uh, more sensitive to some things. So it might, some tips might feel or see, uh, yeah, or seem exaggerated for you, but they're kind of essential for me. So it might not be nothing for you, but still I, I find it worth mentioning because it, it might be meaningful. And uh, I am sensory sensitive, so my, I'm more sensitive to the landscape that is, that is around me and within me, to the sounds and smells and people and moods and, and, uh, and spaces in general. So there's some tips that I have adapted in order to survive and, and thrive in training places. Not always I'm, I'm um, lucky, but, uh, but yeah, sometimes I am. And I need to plan in advance some of the things for me to feel better. And um yeah, and, and having said that, every nervous system is different. So you might be um, experiencing the group very differently. I think we find it out a lot when we are sharing some of the situations with other trainers and they see it very differently or they have very different needs. Um, so um, that's something to mention. So you might also have a need, but a very different strategy to fulfill it. And another thing what I want to uh, mention is this intersectionality and self-care. In this webinar, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, individual self-care on how you can take care of yourself. But it's because self-care is also a question on how the how is our worldview constructed and how the world is constructed. Uh, I want to mention that because when we talk about self-care, we talk about privilege and uh, it's not available and accessible for everyone. Neither tips that I'm going to share will be accessible and av available for everyone. And for those who are not uh, knowing or are new to this term of intersectionality, I want to share that this is a concept that was uh, first articulated by Kimberly Greenshaw, and uh, it refers to have uh, categories like race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability are interconnected to work together, and uh, they affect our individual and collective experiences. And um, the concept also explains how these categories correlate to different yet connected systems of oppression and privilege. And self-care is often about addressing individual problems without much mention to the structural and influential uh, and institutional influences that, the, that prevent our wellness in the first place. So this is also important to, to think uh, when we think about our own self-care and the worldview we kind of live in. And also in a way, the worldview we ask participants to live uh, live in because we construct their experiences and their spaces uh, where they learn and where they are. 
And the last disclaimer that I have, I have three pets and they not always behave in a way that I wish them to behave during the Zoom meeting. So they might be running and sometimes fighting. So if there's a sound behind, it's it's mostly uh, them uh, doing their thing and asking for my attention. <laughs> so don't be scared about that. Yeah, okay. And uh, I have um, divided the webinar in a um, in few fields. And one is sleep, second is rest, movement, food, other elements that I could not fit among uh, these four I mentioned, uh, balanced work schedule. And uh, at the end, um, you might have a Padlet where you can put also your ideas. But I would also welcome you to share uh, your ideas and questions on the chat if you would like to, or maybe you have a link for a great book or a resource. This is also a wonderful opportunity for you to, to put it in so others also can see and explore it uh, from your recommendations. So you're welcome to do that. And let's go to the sleeping as an area. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that I mentioned that you already know and maybe even practice, but uh, I find it interesting to talk about because to be honest, I I don't talk about these things so much. <laughs> so, but I think about them, and it made it made me think uh, what I uh, think are problematic fields in each area, and um, what I notice in in my own experience working for a lot of trainings is that uh, usually there's not enough sleeping hours. I don't know how if you have ever calculated as a trainer how much you sleep. But at least uh, for my, uh, in my experience, I don't sleep enough, especially if the programs uh, are not designed by me. And they, there are a lot of evening uh, programs and trainers want to meet late and so on. Um, so I'm not really uh, yeah, experiencing enough sleeping hours, plus the little quality of the sleep. Um, it's true that the science says uh, that we our brains are scanning new environments usually. And again, or nervous systems are different. So you might be the one who falls asleep e everywhere or anywhere. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. And the first nights are quite uh, quite difficult for me to be sleeping in a new place. And especially because there is a lot of input um, and a lot of activated nervous system because of the conversations with participants and colleagues and ideas on how we can transform and build a program. So that's all in my head when I'm trying to fall asleep. And um, yeah, the, the long working hours do not help us also to kind of down regulate and, and be ready to go to sleep. One thing uh, that you might have experienced when traveling as well a lot is uncomfortable beds and pillows and bedding. And uh, what I notice, I'm struggling a lot to sleep in a, in a single bed when I'm used to sleep in a double bed. And sometimes these things exist and then I kind of need to recalculate my spaciousness and I wake up when I turn. And that also contributes to um, contributes to um, yeah not not having enough uh, quality of the sleep. So it's also good to find out whether um, what kind of bed you will be <laughs> you'll be sleeping in before and and see if you can change it or, or so. But also pillow might be very un uncomfortable and um, not fitting to your needs or the bedding could be too synthetic or this, but that also comes to my sensory sensitivity where I'm quite uh, picky to, to how my sleeping arrangements are. And then uh, we can talk also about noise pollution. I don't know what have been your venues that you've been training in, but um, sometimes um, the hotel uh, walls are super thin and you hear participants left and right. And, and uh, especially if they're very loud or they're, yeah, <laughs> they're entering your, your sleeping hours uh, with um, their events, let's say. So that's also something that might contribute to um, yeah, uh, reduced sleep. And uh, on a side note, the, the silent hotels are actually on the rise as well because slowly hotels are recognizing that this is something this is something essential for people and rest uh, to experience this the silence and not the neighbors per se and uh, yeah as i mentioned the activated nervous system after all days working um and i think as a trainers we are used to the schedules that are super intense and uh 
it's more or less 24 seven work and um, the minds are running full on. And sometimes I have a difficulty uh, on a side note to switch on more office work because I'm used to the trainer's kind of brain of thinking all the time. And it's a way to burn out, I think in, in a usual work. So um, we, it is fine to work short term, but at the same time, um, it is true that our brains are running nonstop and it's a little bit difficult to, to switch off, especially if you're staying in the same place. And the antidote that I found for in, in kind of um, bettering my sleep, I use uh, melatonin. I don't know if you if you know uh, that's uh, kind of a natural hormone some are some people are not very happy with that and i again i'm going to disclaimer of marcus before that uh, it's not a medical advice <laughs> yet my personal experience what hel helps me is bringing that um, yeah natural hormone and and especially using it in the first evenings when i'm uh, much more new to the place and i'm not able to to sleep that well Another thing uh, is uh, yeah, that I have trouble with, especially when I work in a bigger venues, um, I sometimes don't get out for a day and uh, especially in the in the mornings and for those who are non-smokers, maybe you can relate to experience that we don't we don't um, kind of smell fresh air too often <laughs> when we are training. And uh, the only experience I've had, um, going out early in the morning when, was once when I got my dog to, to go to the training with me. And then I was naturally motivated to go out, get out with him because obviously he needs to use the toilet. And that was, uh, that was the moment also I realized how important it is to get out in the morning. But scientifically speaking, uh, going outside, especially in the morning and exposing yourself to the daylight also helps your circadian rhythm to adapt to the time zone that you are in. And uh, so this this could be also a tip uh, to um, give to yourself and maybe even organize some movement uh, energizer or whatever in, in the morning with the participants. So also they get out and they get a good sleep because uh, participants who have slept a lot and well uh, may, make into the better group to work with as well. <laughs> so, so that's somehow important also for you to consider uh, that sometimes we need to put people in the places and processes also that they feel better. And we have that chance and privilege to do that. And of course, if uh, if you're experiencing uh, the sleep problems, I have taken the, the medical sleeping pills as well. I think it's better to, to take them instead of uh, having a sleepless night or CBD sometimes helps also to relax your muscles, but also your mind because it's interconnected. Um, I find it useful the more I age also to uh, not be... Um, not be using alcohol and <laughs> rather exploring this non-alcoholic beverages when socializing with participants because it does influence also my sleep. And as you might know, the, the alcohol is um, both relaxant but also stimulant that does influence <clears throat> that does influence also how how deep we are able to, to uh, sleep. And what helps also is stretching before sleeping. And there's plenty of YouTube videos of a lot of stretches and and um nice ways to move slowly because it again informs our nervous systems that we can rest and we can relax and we are safe and in peace and that makes us more sleepy as well another thing which i have not done really is bringing your own pillow and comfort blanket and i know that you will have a you have a session with nick later and marcus mentioned something about the bringing your own pillow um i've seen participants do it but I have never done it. But I always remember about the tip on the first nights when I when I lay my head on the pillow and realize, no, it's not going to be a good night. And um, this is uh, one trick that I would like to practice much more. And I, I always forget uh, before it's too late. But I think it could be very useful. And that's why I'm mentioning that. And uh, always, always, always bring earplugs and sleep mask. I think they, they also contribute to the better sleep. And especially the earplugs. I think this is something also to provide as a as a as an organizer for participants. Because if we are um, to ask them to share the rooms, we never know, um, yeah, what their neighbor um, is like 
during the nights, <laughs> how loud they are. And again, if you link, if you think holistically, uh, their their sleep is essential for the learning as well. So providing them or rem reminding them to take take them with them is also something that might help to improve the quality of the training. But uh, for me, it helps. And also, if we talk about the benefit of um, the benefit of um, kind of be sensory deprived because we are among people all day and uh, which is really contributing and it's also a way of um, kind of uh, making us happy and making us well it's also essential that we switch off and when we have these earplugs and a little bit more silence then it's also depriving us of, of one sense so we can kind of rest and uh, come out a little bit more rested yeah. So that's that. And uh, going forward, um, what helps me as well more, I um, have had sleep problems. They run in a family and um, my head is thinking a lot. So lately I have uh, found the Kindle really helps me. Um, first of all, it, it's dark when you read it. So naturally or melatonin is secreted much better and uh, our nervous system is more ready to fall asleep because when there's a light and a book, you still kind of are exposed to the light. Um, and uh, what I've read and what works for me to watch the TV series that are very simple, that are not very stimulating, or maybe something that you have seen before already. I know that there's this um, science also that you shouldn't be exposed to the screen, but the benefit of... Uh, of um, seeing something that you have already seen is it is just relaxing and comforting and uh, lower the brightness of your screen and you should be fine <laughs> with that. And of course, there are plenty of relaxation exercises that you can try to do and there's plenty of apps and all you need to do is really explore something else that, that's very helpful that I found for me. And uh, there's a lot of psychological science that backs it up is a... Uh, is the progressive muscle relaxation. And how it works is that we are tensing our body um, part by part, and we can try it now even. So if you tense your uh, feet, it might sound weird and maybe the practice is weird, but try if you squeeze your uh, and, and make contraction in your feet, and then you go all the way up to the lower legs, then around your knees, to the upper legs, to your bum, to your belly, to your rib cage, to your chest, and then both hands, and then the neck, and also your face. And it's a little bit difficult for me to speak and say. And then you completely relax, relax and, and let go and do it multiple times and, and see um, how it helps. And usually we are we might not be very mindful or aware that we are uh, tensed. So that helps us to both tense everything in your body and then let go. Even if you're tense and if you're not really aware that this is happening, um, that it's a way to relax your body. So this is something that you might uh, you might try and see if it works or it doesn't, or you need the TV series work better than the progressive muscle relaxation, for instance, or you might combine those two. And, uh, and another thing which goes back to this wider picture of self-care is rethinking the program design and do you really need an evening program for participants? Because at least, uh, as I mentioned, 20 years ago, we we had to have evening program. We had to be present all the time and not have too long lunch break and so on. I think our needs are changing. Well, at least mine are. And um, I realized that, um, yeah, the re restful evenings are good for, for me and also good for participants. Not to say that you cannot organize an evening or two, but I think it's important to um, rethink uh, the motivation behind an evening program. Is it for you? Is it for participants? Um, is it doing well for them and for you? And, and really evaluate the importance of that. Understanding that that uh, rest and self-care is revolutionary and educational as well, going back to that quote. And another thing which I think now is practiced is a single room that really helps. Uh, I think for the first 10 years of my training life, we stayed in the same room with, with my colleague trainers. I don't know, that was a concept, even with the national agency representatives. Um, when I started working, that was 
that was fine, uh, but we need that solitude and we need that space alone to self-regulate. There's a space for self-regulation, there's a space for co-regulation, but I find it very important also to, to have a space for yourself, especially working with people, so we don't we don't get exhausted at the end of the training. And something that I experienced when actually Marcus organized a training, uh, he arranged for us trainers to stay in another venue. And um, usually it doesn't happen out of out the kind of, uh, I don't know, the, the logistics that the hotel is one <laughs> and, and the space is one. But I found it very, very uh, luxury actually to be able to go out of the training space. And especially when we were walking um, up the hill with my colleague trainer, it was helpful to both to reflect and also kind of distance yourself from the program and everything. And um and, and I found it super, super helpful. And I think I, I felt much more restored, staying a little bit away and um, and then coming the next morning quite refreshed. So that's a luxury and not, not accessible for uh, every space, but I think it's very helpful. And what I'm now practicing is also staying in a, in a room that's a little bit further away. And even when I'm telling you, that sounds like, oh, you should be more social and, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't be requesting those things. But I think it's very, very important to kind of attend to those needs and also realize actually the difference they make uh, to the quality of your work and, and to the health of yours. So that's something also that I find useful. And then going forward. Just one thing, Ilse, because sure. as I said, you're talking to a black box. You're doing very well. It's going great. You're not in a hurry. You still have lots of time. There's already some feedback in the chat. We'll go through it later. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing the presentation. It's all going super well. Awesome. Okay. Going forward. Yeah, a little bit interesting things with the with the presentation. Um, rest. Um, even though the sleep can be considered a, a rest, but there are some tips uh, tips that I have uh, been uh, that I have found useful also for me. I don't know if what do you do with your coffee breaks uh, during the coffee breaks and the trainings. Usually, uh, I prepare for the session or or um, I do have some maybe unhealthy scrolling even on a mobile phone, but I don't really um, take a take a proper break which I think is very, very essential, even at taking a walk or just distancing yourself again. I remind myself, I, I, I uh, sometimes fail fail to uh, take a proper break, break, but this is also something essential. Because if we think about in general uh, for a day, it's four or five days, four or five hours, we can do a cognitive work and then we need to balance it out with other types of work. So uh, to have this 30 minutes for yourself, breathing, drinking tea, and uh, maybe even talking about non-trainer things could be very, very useful. Uh, another thing, it of course depends on your, your um, collaboration with your colleagues and so on, but it's a question also if you allow the other trainer to facilitate and if you can sit back, because it's also a bit of uh, time for your restoration and rest. You don't need to be always there uh, with the questions or inputs. This is how I like to facilitate that I give space for, uh, for the other trainer to be. And this is also something to be communicated. And sometimes it's a weird conversation because there's a different expectations for your from your colleague trainer. But um, I realized that, um, yeah, that this is somehow easier for me, even if the trainer, the other trainer screws up or not, not uh, makes the process the way I, I wish it was. It's still in a long term, much more sustainable for me to kind of take a break and, and, and allow them also to be um, to be how they are. And um, yeah, doing what makes you happy during the course and during the breaks. I think this is also something to be um, thought and planned before. And what I started to do this year is also kind of a make a plan what I could do in the training course um, for myself and to feel better. So I can um, kind of note down what I have done and, uh, and be, ha be happier about it. Also, you can try relaxation exercises during breaks, nature walks, uh, work really well, uh, both with the group and also uh, for yourself. Um, allow long lunch breaks. I don't know how much time you schedule for the lunch breaks, but I think people really appreciate if you have a, 
you have a capacity to do uh, at least two hours. I don't know how it works, I, but even in national agency trainings, uh, I, I do them and it works quite fine. I've needed explaining also people why you think the two hours break could be essential and needed. Um, and I think as a reset for, for you, mid half day, it's also essential to, to have that, um, that two hours for yourself. And then something that, that can be done and also might be seen weird at the beginning is that you don't have to necessarily have uh, food with participants. It can be a rest also to be eating with them and, and uh, joking and laughing. And it's a, it's a good experience, but you, we don't have to eat also with participants. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, that this, is also, this can be also a solo time because we don't take the mask of a trainer even then. And um, I know that some, some national agencies and organizations don't calculate working hours during the food times, which I think is, is not very good practice because uh, you're still working. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's not that we cannot be ourselves, but it's still our working time. And we still are trainers in, in eyes of the participants and we still kind of behave accordingly and, um, yeah, serve our role. And then another another thing is the creating space for mini breaks throughout the day and um, introduce maybe also the idea for, for your colleague trainer, um, which can help you um, yeah, stay accountable for each other for those things. Then we can go for a movement. And um, I don't know about you, but I feel very different after the course that I facilitated uh, comparing, yeah, depending how much movement there is. It's if it's sitting around the circle or not circle, but I feel much more drained and tired. And um, and we often sit habitually, which is also not very uh, healthy, possibly, because when we are under the stress, we are much more likely to fall in our habits. And, um, and they can be also a little bit harmful for us. What I've seen also that there's very little space in a program to integrate movement and exercise. And uh, sometimes there's no motivation also to integrate movement on breaks or even when you go to your uh, room and um, there's a free time, it's not necessarily easy to kind of dedicate it for more self-care practices or more movement because you're already tired and kind of want to dedicate uh, time for things that you just love to do. And of course, the lack of movement influences us also our overall energy and uh, it does affect our moods. And uh, I think we, we know how we feel after exercise or when we don't have it, the opposite of it. So um, that that is also uh, affecting how we are uh, feeling about ourselves. That affects our efficiency and also motivation for further self-care. So these are things I have identified and um, going forward on uh, what I find helpful is um, introducing more movement energizers. I don't do much energizers these days anymore. Also because maybe because I work more with, with adults, less with youth, but I find it very helpful um, that, I don't know, we can start morning, even one person after another showing an exercise that they love and we are all repeating very simple or we have a dance together or you can put or you can learn a few chair chair stretching exercises and show it to the group. Usually they like it. I think it's much more easier for for a kind of uh, non-professional to be teaching these things because uh, then you don't focus on perfection or alignment, but rather on on kind of experience. So there's a plenty of things you can do. And I think people really appreciate that. Plus you as a trainer kind of reach your own movement goals. And I think that the mood is really impacted once we um, create space for, for kind of more mobility and movement and play in our training spaces. And um, you can integrate also movement exercises throughout the program, uh, walk and talk with your colleagues and also introduce it for for participants and uh, people also need your participants also need fresh air and and walks and um, also they might be struggling to um, integrate movement in their own kind of day-to-day uh, -day life at the training course so you might help to create that space and this also helping you to to move more and get out more 
And uh, it's also good to schedule your time for movement. And um, some of my, my colleague trainers have their uh, online training programs that they uh, follow through or they have online class every evening. So it's good also to kind of uh, see see when you um, when in the program you can integrate your own practice and, and plan it ahead. And then packing a movement clothing, an excuse that I've had is that I don't have appropriate clothing for movement. So <laughs> to have a clothing that would be yeah, helpful for you to get out and move or a mat if it's pack, uh, packageable within your luggage or a certain equipment that might be very helpful. And something I want to show you something that I take with me. Uh, depending on on the mood that I have, and it's this. Oh, it doesn't show. See, yes, you need to hold it straight <laughs> in the camera exactly. There, it's inflatable, physio. But okay, you saw a little bit of it. <laughs> the good thing for the package uh, packaging for the luggage, it's inflatable, so you can uh, reduce it to to your Reiner or whatever size, uh, and you can do a lot of exercises. Just put it on YouTube and and uh, and explore explode with uh, a lot of funny things. And uh, another thing which is very easy, easily um, usable, let's see if it, it's a, it's a resistance band. Yeah, you saw something like that. I have a lot of violet, uh, it turns out, in my, in my equipment. Um, but yeah, this is something that's so easy to pack. You don't need to have a proper gym or anything, but even these two things. And, and I have much more, but I'm afraid uh, that the screen will not be able to recognize that as a, as a showable thing. But you can choose already one thing that you want to take with you. And that's something that I do also to kind of uh, diversify the movement, not to make it as a as a obligatory thing. But I choose one thing that I always take take for the for the training course. And it's good to pack it with you so you feel more obliged to do it as well. Then going forward with the food, mm, something also that was already mentioned uh, the low quality of food and poor nutrition. I'm I'm the person that complains very little about the food. I always take something that I want. But at the same time, if it's a longer training course, then I, I start to complain, at least to myself. And <laughs> and uh, I realize how much um, yeah it, it influences my own well-being. There's too much sugar often in coffee breaks or carbohydrates. And um, it's also a challenging being on different feeding uh, schedule. <laughs> it sounds strange for adults feeding schedule, but indeed, like, uh, I don't know about your rhythms, but you kind of stick to the somebody else's schedule. So that can be also challenging for the body. Availability of clean drinking water or drinking enough of that uh, can, be, can be one thing. And then alcohol consumption. I'm not against alcohol consumption. I, I I I drink myself, but I also realize that that, that the influence um, on our bodies is there, and I think it's important also to realize and then I make a conscious choice about that. Do I speak about that? And um, yeah, something very simple that that might help is a request coffee breaks with fruits and veggies. It's helpful for participants, but also for you. Um, to be uh, having these nutrients at hand. It's good to track water intake. Um, there's plenty of bottles already available uh, where you can measure how much you want and and make a, make a goal before the training course so you know if you're reaching or not. Bring your healthy snacks or pre-prepared meal if you're um, used to the oatmeal or oatmeal breakfast or... If you're hungry in the evenings, especially if the time zone is different or if, um, if she, yeah, I don't know, sometimes uh, you're used to eat at nine and then the venue provides food at six and then you're suffering every evening. So it's good to, to pack some soups or something, at least that you are uh, prepared and happy. Take your vitamins and minerals to substitute for a few days of lower quality of the food. And try non-alcoholic beverages for socializing. <laughs> that is that that might be also uh, motivating, uh, yeah, to to be more healthy. And then other elements um, that I want to talk about is very simple things you can do once you go to your room after a long day training, or even if you don't have a residential training and you go home. 
um, just laying down on the floor, I find it very, very helpful and grounding and just staying there. Um, what is very popular, at least this uh, this part of Europe where I have been working, are these pranamat mats. Um, these are mats with the with the needles, and a lot of people ask me if they are beneficial. And um, I, I usually don't know how to answer, not to um, demotivate them to use them and lay down on them. Um, because the impact is not laying on that needle mat, but is the, the greatest impact is on laying down and just staying there. So whatever motivates you to lay down and be still and help your nervous system to kind of down regulate is helpful. Uh, whether it's expensive mat and you need it, it's your choice. <laughs> Sometimes it, it can be very, very motivating, but uh, laying down um, is free <laughs> and it's very effective as well uh, to stay there for five to 10 minutes or so on. Put the legs up on the wall. We are standing a lot uh, as trainers and, and it really helps our, our lymphatic uh, flow um, that we put the legs on the wall and just rest. Uh, Self-massage, you can also, sometimes when I forget the tennis ball, tennis ball is something that I always take also for the for the courses because I I can lay down on it and, and um, kind of work on my trigger points and uh, massage my back a little bit. And it's very helpful that usually uh, around the, among the, the, the things that the organizer provides are the tennis balls because I can use them straight away. And uh, yeah, you can do that also in, in your room um, or foam roller, but foam rollers are, are harder to pack. Um, facial masks, something that I find also uh, as a self-care routine, I, I always pack it when I go to the training course because it's I hold space all the day for the other people and I take care about the other people. And it's, it's, a, it's very essential that I take care of myself. And this is one pleasant thing that I feel I, I feel good uh, after. And um, yeah, this is like I've taken care of myself a little bit more check in. Contrast showers work really nicely with the cold and, and hot water. This is something I practice on, on the trainings as well. And then sh just shaking out and uh, the same progressive muscle relaxation that I mentioned, I find helpful as well because there's a tension we accumulate during the course. And even if I try to be relaxed trainer and, um, I guess I am. I still notice that there's a tension when I'm listening deeply for the people. There's a tension in my neck or the shoulders or, you know, there's a there's a, con a constant contraction somewhere. So these are practices to kind of release whatever has been accumulating during the day. I find them very, very useful before I hit the bed and and, um, and can fall asleep. And of course, there are other rituals that you might share in the chat. I'm so curious now what's there. But I'll finish my presentation, then, then I will look as a surprise. <laughs> um, so these things and uh, more other elements. Mm, I don't know how much you prepare for um, doing, the, doing the training, but what I find very important for the teachers and trainers alike is to do a warm-up exercise for the voice. That goes also under the self-care for me. I don't know if you do it. I would be curious to know. Um, but uh, we need to take care of our voices and uh, our our, um, our vocal cords, and it's a really good practice to be. Um, if you don't know any any vocal exercises, there's a plenty on YouTube as well. But I recommend you to do it. And when I I used to teach a lot of classes, and going there uh, by the car, I usually had plenty of time to warm up my voice. And I think this is also part of the self-care hygiene that we warm our voices and um, that we uh, we take care of, of those parts. And uh, yeah, and that can be also felt. Check the supply of fresh air. Sometimes I forget that. So it's good also for that my colleague of the uh, colleague trainer uh, notices that uh, other people are close to faint and <laughs> we need that, um, that essential element of air. We are much more aware after pandemics, but but still this is something where I I um I get tired and then I wonder like why I'm tired and it's a it's a little um element of uh, you know, not having enough fresh air. So this is something you can even kind of uh, talk about, talk with your colleague trainer, how much you manage the space and who remembers what, because we cannot take care of everything for ourselves unless we facilitate it for ourselves. And um, 
but it's good also is communicating your needs to the organizers and call facilitators and talk about uh, what's going on, how much rest you need and how much rest you expect. So you can also have a, have similar expectations or, or the other person is realizing of your needs. Um, and taking care of your needs when organizing the program and training space. We are very good at taking care of participants and kind of thinking what could be the program like, but I think we do need to remember um, what is that we also need as a humans, um, yeah, with, with the physiological kind of boundaries. And uh, when I when I talk about this, I'm also uh, remembering a lot of people who know how to take care of themselves and need to, <laughs> need to learn to take care of the others more. So we have these different polarities, but I think, uh, yeah, it's important to kind of navigate through, through um, what you need and organize the program according to that. And drafting your self-care plan for each training and monitoring the process. This is something that I do with a checklist. I plan what, what good, great things I can do during the training course. And then they, I check them out at the end of the, not at the end, but in the process of uh, the training course. Going forward, uh, I'm talking about balanced work schedules. You will have a whole webinar on that I, I read. But... Um, yeah, I, what I what I find useful, having worked with many different trainers, is it's not the pleasure to be working uh, with a trainer who jumps from training to training. It's really felt sense. And it's almost a um, very different presence. And uh, I have had times when I needed to support both the group and also another trainer. Not that I need it, but I kind of made a choice, uh, apparently. But that was an extra work on, on my hands as well. And I think we need to take responsibility of our self-care and not, not kind of um, make emotional and physical labor um, to another trainer. Um, yeah, that's kind of work ethics. I think to come rested as much as possible uh, to another training course so you can share the job job uh, responsibilities and presence equally with another trainer. So it's important also to schedule a break after uh, after having the training. And I realize as I grown older, I uh, I feel my, <laughs> I feel much more uncomfortable, I think, scheduling the break because it seems like the time is limited and I need to be efficient and keep working. Maybe also because the world is changing. When I was younger, I I uh, felt fine taking three breaks, uh, three day breaks after three day training. Now I feel like, oh, I, I need to keep working. So I, I need to remind myself that um, the three days is very, very essential or two free days uh, for me to keep going on this course. And that means also uh, we had a conversation um, before we started this webinar. That means also that uh, you need to calculate how much your free day will cost for the for the employee because this is also something important to notice and, and know that our trainings work is uh, difficult and that requires preparation and that requires also rest and sometimes much more than uh, for, I don't know, somebody working for the office if I can compare and that might influence also the price that you put on yourself. So um, yeah, it's, it's essential to remember that we need... We need rest after the work that we have done, especially in the trainer's position. And free day means free day. I have nothing else to say, but I think uh, <laughs> I think we usually uh, do a lot of things that we are not. Yeah, we we don't manage to do in or in our day to day life, um, and do not rest during these free days. And then getting care for your body, whether it's physiotherapy, massage, spa, flotation tank, um, I find it very, very uh, rejuvenating to have this flotation tank for um, sensory deprivation. If you haven't tried it, I, I really welcome you to, to see what it's like to, to be there, especially after the having intense training course with a group. And even if it does not feel like... Um, yeah, and see how it influences the, the perception and then how rested you feel. Or sometimes when you start to do these things, we understand how exhausted we are. That's a side effect of the self-care as well. <laughs> but that's also a good side effect because then you can kind of um, yeah get to know yourself and attend to your needs. And another thing, which is also mental but physical, again, we hold space for the groups. We hold space for the people and, and sometimes for the deep processes, depending on how you work. 
And it's really important to realize also that we need to be in spaces where people uh, can hold us. And it means, uh, or psychotherapists, physiotherapists, where they can take care of ourselves. This is really needs to be balanced and we cannot ask our partners or our families to take care of ourselves. We, need, uh, we can, but I think it, it can be also, um, yeah, kind of outsourced and it's professional to be going to the spaces where we can be held. And yeah, just recognize the complexity of our work and, and the extra need for rest and solitude. And here we, we can talk about the, yeah, the recognition of our um, work and um, also how much actually we realize that it's quite difficult and, and challenging and complex. And that requires serious attitude and serious action towards rest and self-care. And then going forward, um, here's a brief backing list that I always have. Very simple things. Uh, sleep mask, earplugs, earphones, again, uh, for a little bit depriving myself uh, from that space and going into the, I don't know, jazz, classical music or podcasts, wherever you want to uh, distance yourself uh, with. Um, Kindle helps, uh, self-care cosmetics, movement equip equipment of choice, comfortable clothes for movement indoor outdoors, and uh, comfort health foods, all that I already mentioned. Um, and then I would like to close this webinar with the two quotes. Two, because I could not make a choice, which is better one. So you tell me. <laughs> and one is rest is not idleness, uh, which means laziness. And uh, to lie sometimes on the grass on a summer day, listening to the murmur of water or watching the clouds float across the sky is hardly a waste of time. And then another one, it's not that I'm now able to rest because I have done the work. Rather, it is because I rest that I'm able to work. So it is about um, yeah, refocusing or reframing how we view rest and self-care and also realizing that self-care is revolutionary and educational. So that's it for me. Ah, yeah, and uh, if you want to stay in touch, uh, these are my uh, contacts. And the last slide, is, and the last slide is this. Thanks a lot, and a lot of logos. <laughs> so thank you. I hope I hope you got some ideas. I'm gonna go to the chat now, and see what's there. Exactly. If you have thank questions. you so much, Ilza. Take a zip of water. You've been talking nonstop, sixty Please. minutes, talking about physical <laughs> health. Provided us such a treasure chest of concrete hacks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, really.